All right, good evening, everyone. I want to thank you all for coming to this edition of the Holland Land Office Museum's Guest Speaker Series. Uh, this is something that we started about five years ago, and we are still going strong. And uh, this year, we were actually supported in part to a grant through GoArt from the New York State Decentralization Grant Program. So we want to thank them for supporting us and allowing us to uh, become bigger and better. Uh, so this month, uh, well, the next presenter, uh, we have Deanne Quinn Miller here, who is, we're very excited to have finally come and speak to us about her book that was released last year, mm -hmm. uh, The Prison Guard's Daughter. And we've been in communication for several months leading up to this to uh, get this ready for everybody. But I uh, want to thank you all for coming. And as long as she's OK with it, we do have copies for sale in the bookstore that I'm sure she'd be happy to sign for anyone if you're interested. Uh, but we can take care of that afterwards. So, Dan, take it away. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Thank you everybody. So, um, if you don't mind, I would just assume that this be rather informal because it's a small group. So, while I'm talking, if something comes up, feel free to yell out something or raise your hand or if you have a question, you know, feel free because I think it's uh, more interesting, you know, when people kind of put in their own information. And it's always scary to me um, when I'm here in small groups, especially, you know, close to Attica, because I'm guessing that the reason why many of you are here is because you have a connection with Attica in some way or another. And that, like, a little bit scares me. Um, I'd rather almost speak to a, a cloud of, you know, a, a crowd of a thousand people where really no, nobody knows me or nobody knows um, anything really about the riot. But I know, as I look around the room here, and by talking earlier, there's already a lot of connections um, to Attica. Um, and nobody has to identify themselves, obviously, unless you care to. Um, let me know what your connection is to Attica, maybe now or as we go on. Um, but um, one of my questions, can everybody hear me okay? No. No? Nope. Well, Come it. on up. Be, be I'm usually pretty loud. Maureen can hear me from down the street. Can you use your mommy voice? Use my mom. Can you hear me, Mr. Kerr? The air conditioner kicked on as we thought it did. Oh, that made it worse? Does this make it better if I hold on to the iPhone? Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So you can hear me now? All right. So as we go on, if you've got something to say, you want to add, you know, by all means, please do. Um, I always say before I begin, you know, um, I wrote this book um, at the encouraging of Gary Craig, who is a fine um, writer for the Rochester DNC. I never intended to write a book. Um, the only thing I ever intended to do was to collect information that I could leave uh, for my daughters so that they could know who their grandfather was. And then from there, it just kind of spiraled into something much bigger, um, which was this book contract that I got last year. And um, we ended up writing this book in five and a half weeks, which is ridiculous, um, with two weeks worth of editing. Um, so you might find some mistakes in there. Um, but you know, they are what they are. So um, I want to thank you guys for coming out tonight, though. And here comes my sister, Amy, who will not enter the room anonymously. <laughs> <laughs> There's a chair right up here. Right <laughs> I also want to be respectful of everyone else's experiences. You know, um, it, when I talk, it is my own experience. It's my memoir. It's my story. There are millions of stories of Africa. Um, stories about inmates, stories about guards, guards and inmates, the state police. Um, and everybody has their own opinion. And I'm not here to change anybody's opinion. I'm not here to change your history. I'm just here to tell you about my story of Attica and how it is that um, we grew up um, in Attica uh, alongside the riot. So I guess I'll start with my childhood, our childhood, now that Amy's here, I have to say everything in plurals. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up in Attica um, was a really great place, um, I think. We, you know, Attica is a small town. 
And it, you know, it looked much different, obviously, than what it did today. We had a bunch of industry there. Um, and although we had industry, the prison was probably um, the main employer of, of Attica. And I will say we lived on 11 Windsor Street, and I think there were a dozen houses or so um, on each side of the street. And probably three quarters of them were filled with people who either worked in the civilian aspect at the jail or worked um, as a correctional officer at the jail. Everybody on my street, you know, worked in corrections, worked with my dad. My father carpooled, although it was only like two miles, um, would carpool with a couple of the people on the street as well. That's how close we lived to the prison. Um, my grandfather, um, which people have already asked me about, my grandfather Quinn, um, Al Quinn, he was a meat cutter, so he was a civilian employee. And uh, when my mom and dad got married, it was my grandfather Quinn who encouraged my dad to um, apply to the Department of Corrections. Um, my dad at that time was a social worker um, at the psychiatric center um, for adolescents in West Seneca. And, um, wasn't making a lot of money, was on the road a lot, and so my grandfather encouraged him to take the uh, officer's exam, which he did, and uh, I think Dad started, I was born in 65, I think Dad started in 69, um, and he was down in Greenhaven first, and then was eventually tra you know, transferred up to Attica. So we lived um, in this little house in Attica that was just perfect, everything was perfect, everybody knew who you were. If you were out of line, you probably, your mother was gonna hear about it before you got back home. So, uh, also when we were a little, um, when Amy was a baby, one of the things that you could do that I don't think I would do today is my mother would send us with money to go buy baby food at Acme. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and it was, I remember it was like seven cents a jar, six cents a jar, and she would give us like two dollars or something, and we would each carry a big huge brown bag home of baby food for Amy. And everybody knew who we were, we were the Quinn girls, because we all, you know, I had dark hair, my next sister had red hair, of course, when she was born, she's dark hair, looks most like my father than any one of us. Um, but we had a great childhood in Attica. And um, I was the first to go to school in Attica, um, at Attica Elementary. Christine stayed home. She was three at the time in 1971. And for anybody who doesn't know, the riot was September 9th through the 13th of 1971. So on the 9th, my father goes to work and Prior to all this, um, you should probably know that there was uh, a great deal of unrest at the prison. Um, in the months prior, there was actually a manifesto that was circulated in early June by the inmates. And at that point, it had about 28 demands on it. And um, those 28 demands were mostly humanitarian in nature. Things like um, additional toilet paper, more than one roll a month, they wanted to be able to get um, magazines um, for people of color. Um, they wanted pork being taken out of their diet um, if they were Muslim. And the inmates were fed on about 21 cents a day. So their diet was not real great, and that was one of the other things that they were asking for, was for fresh fruit and vegetables and so on. Um, at that time, although it's closed now, the attic prison used to have a farm on the back side of the prison. I know many of you are shaking your head, so you know where it is. And the farm was for many, many years. I don't even know how many years. Um, but that farm grew a lot of livestock that was used and also you know, crops and things like that that were used in the prison. And the funny thing is growing up in Attica, um, it always seemed like it, the whistle would blow sometimes. Um, and it would blow loudly and not for very long. And usually that meant to townspeople that an inmate had walked off. Now when I say something like this, when I'm talking at UBE or someplace, people are like their eyeballs are falling out of their head because they can't believe that an inmate would just walk off and shouldn't the entire city be locked down. And, but it wasn't like that for us. Um, a lot of times inmates just walked off. Um, not that there wasn't a care, but we just continued with our lives, you know? You're going to school or you're going to work, whatever it is, there's an inmate out. And the only time we ever got really nervous was if it was on the news or it made like the TV news, you know, although if it wasn't on WBTA or something. But within a matter of hours, most of the time, the inmate was caught, usually in Buffalo or Rochester. There's train tracks that go east and west right through Attica so that inmate can jump on the train, follow the tracks, whatever. And most of those people who worked on the farm were kind of honor inmates, if you will. I mean, they were really not supposed to be flight risks, but I guess at any time you can change your mind. 
so just take off. Um, so I was at school the day of the prison riot. Um, I was in my first day of first grade, and um, knowing that prison whistle um, started going off, and the prison says that the riot started at 8.55. The whistle started going off about 9.24-ish or so, they said, um, or so I've investigated. Um, and the whistle just went off and kept going off and kept going off and kept going off. And you could see that the teachers were getting very nervous because um, many of the women that were teachers, hi Jeff and Donna, um, were um, wives of the men who worked at the prison. And um, I remember many of them being in the hallway kind of talking. I remember the lights in our classroom being turned off. And then I remember the ambulance whistle going off. And I knew what that meant because my father was president of the fire department. So when the whistle went, dad did too. And so here we are in this classroom and we're all supposed to be quiet and the lights are turned on and all this is going on and there's all this business in the hallway. People are getting information, something might be going on at the prison. Now mind you, I'm just a little kid, so I don't know this. This is all stuff that I've learned later on. Um, and at some point, um, mid-morning, was when the principal came to my kindergarten door, or my first grade door, um, and asked to, to pull me out of the class. And I remember that I started to cry um, because I thought I was in trouble, and I didn't want to be in trouble. Um, but as I was walking down to the hallway, or walking down the hallway, he didn't really say anything to me. But when I got in the office, our neighbor was there. And my neighbor never picked us up from school. We walked to and from school, or another neighbor would pick us up, but not this neighbor. And it was Lowy Witowski. And I don't know if anybody's from Attica here, but the Witowskis are a big family. And Mr. Witowski also worked at the prison as a corrections officer. And Lowy was there. And I uh, get in the car with her. My sister Christine is there, who's three years old. She's in the car. And she tells us that she's going to be taking us to Darianne to stay with my mother's um, mother and father, um, that my father was hurt at the prison, and that um, my, mother, my father was hurt at the prison, my mother was going to be going up to the hospital, um, and that we would be staying with Grandma and Grandpa for a time. I was like, all right, I didn't think anything of it at all. Of course, you know, I'm five. I have like really no, I'm just going to grandma's house. I really love her room that's there. We used to call it the pretty room. And if you got to stay there, it was a really awesome <laughs> time. And just being with my grandparents was always a great time. Um, days and days went on. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna push forward a little bit as to what it is that I learned. Um, because as a child, obviously I didn't know a lot of this, but while I'm at my grandmother's and my father is in the hospital, um, there's a riot that is going on in the prison. Um, and at this point, there was about 2,300 um, inmates that were in Attica um, in a facility that was built for only 1,600. So um, it was about 45% overcrowded at that time. Mm -hmm. Your voice stopped when you said, 2,300 were in a prison that was built for, and your voice went way down. 1,600. 1,800? 16. 1,600. 16. 16, about 45%. Oh, mm -hmm. boy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes, it was as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was, I don't know if anybody's been in Attica, but it's an old jail. I mean, it's an old jail. And they have, you know, I mean, it was crowding. There, were, like I said, there was a lot of tension going on earlier in the summer because they had made these demands. Um, and they knew that there was unrest in the prison, so much so that um, my father was told by a union uh, representative to leave his belongings behind, uh, his personal belongings, which went, no, do not wear your wedding ring, don't bring your wallet, make sure you have no photos of your family on you, so that the inmates would even know that you had a family. Um, and just days before the riot, my father sat down with my mother um, and, my, and back then, you know, the men always paid the bills and the women always took care of the kids in the house and showed my mother where the checkbook was and where the bills were and how he paid them, which was unusual. Um, but I think that he, he truly knew that something bad was going on at the jail. Um, and while my father, while this whole ride is going on, my dad, um, what happened to him happened in Times Square. So. 
Um, the prison essentially has like four blocks to it, and there's a main hub of the prison, and it's called Times Square. And my father was working vacation relief that day, which is a job that you take um, to fill in, but he had been on that um, assignment for a little while. So essentially, he stayed in the middle of this hub, and he would open and close doorways. That's all he did all day long. So um, a company of inmates would come through. One company is about 44. Um, and they would let them in. He locks the door. Everybody's there. He go If they're going to chow, he unlocks the door, puts, puts them through. So on that day, um, things were really bad because there was an incident that happened the night before. And I'm sorry for skipping all of this, but I have 278 pages I'm trying to cover in about 40 minutes. So Take all the um, time you want. I know, but I want to keep everybody. I, I could talk about it for days, weeks, years. Um, but anyhow, so... What ended up happening to my father was that he was in Times Square at the time that there were two companies in a tunnel, which is really hard to explain because it's really not a tunnel. It's just above ground, but it kind of looks like a tunnel, and then above it they call it the catwalk. So there were two companies in a tunnel, which was about 80, I think there was 84 men that were in there. And they were very displeased because the door that went out to the yard where they exercised was locked. Um, because of the situation the night earlier, which you can read about in the book. Um, and it just erupted. And at the time, our corrections officers carried billy clubs, which they would typically not use on inmates, but they would use on the wall you, for knocking. You would knock to have them walk and knock to have them stop, and the inmates knew the whole thing. Um, but that day, uh, many of the corrections officers that were in there um, were badly beaten. Um, by the inmates that were in that tunnel. And then they sent Sergeant Curtis in um, because he was kind of a restoring justice kind of a guy and they beat him as well. So now the inmates now have access to keys that were on the corrections officer's belts that were going that way to the other end of the prison which is where um, the wood shop is and the metal shop was um, as well as other tiers, because um, the prison is, you know, it looks like it's two-tiered, and it is two-tiered in some spots, and then to other buildings as well. So what the inmates were able to do were to go in and get additional weapons, to go into the wood shop and grab things. I mean, if I could tell you when I went into the evidence intake center and that quantum hut um, at the state police department, the number of garbage cans full of baseball bats was the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. I didn't even know they made that many baseball bats. Um, but they all got weapons, metal weapons, wooden weapons, and uh, then they came back through. And at that point, they had the ability to also unlock additional tiers, which meant that there were more inmates coming through. Um, and at the time my father was there, he could see that this is going on. So my father decides for the safety of the other corrections officers that are in the area with him, he locks them in some of the other um, tunnels. So he locks them behind gates and the inmates are coming back. They're yelling to my father. Um, there is a telephone system. So you have to remember back then there wasn't like those radios that they wear now. Um, there was one phone and it, the system was so antiquated that if you picked up the phone and there was somebody on the phone anywhere in the prison, it would ring busy. So my father picked up the phone. The phone was busy. So he had no way of getting information to anybody other than the other officers that were locked in the same portions of the jail for now were running back and, and, and trying to bring help. Um, so there's my father and apparently, according to other people, he could see what was going on. And the interesting thing that I think a lot of people don't know is, you know, I think the prison was built in 1936, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It's old. And when the, when the prison was built, oddly enough, an A tunnel gate there. When you lock the doors, you have a rod that ascends into the ceiling and you have a rod that descends into the floor. The rod that ascended into the ceiling was actually made originally too short. So they put a butt weld on it. And now I'm a welding expert because now I have to find out what a butt weld is. And it's one of the um, least strong, I think, kinds of welds. And it's often likely that with pressure and so on, it would snap at that particular point. And unfortunately, that's exactly what the gate did. This huge metal gate came down and um, did not follow my dad. It fell. The inmates kicked it over. 
and with that they had access to my dad. And they beat him so severely that uh, he sustained two open skull fractures. Um, it was literally fighting for his life. Um, he was left um, in Times Square and other inmates um, beat him as well as they went by. And I had always wondered, and I'd always thought, I wonder how long he laid there. I wonder, because I, I, here I am in school and I'm being taken out, being taken to grandma's house. At this point, my, my, my father's been injured. And come to find out, it had been nearly three hours that he laid there and was brought up to the administration building and then was taken to the hospital. But corrections officers didn't go in and get my dad. At that time, the prison was deemed too dangerous. Lucky for my dad, um, there were inmates who knew my dad and liked my dad. Uh, one of them was the name of Richard Clark, um, who people believe he was leader of the riot, one of the leaders of the riot. He was also Muslim. And he went into A Block and got a mattress and put my father on the mattress. And him and uh, three other Muslim brothers brought my dad on a mattress to the front of the administration building to try to bring him to safety. Um, and they yelled to the administration and told them that we have one of your own. And they said, thank you very much. Put him down and get back. Eventually they brought my father into the administration building. And I sat through testimony um, of where another correction officer actually stepped over my father to clock in as he lay on this mattress in order to help retake the prison. So I think at that time they were a little worried about retaking parts of the prison and they were getting my dad to safety. I have no idea what time an ambulance was called. Obviously it was an ambulance from Batavia um, that took him back to the hospital. They took him to Batavia Hospital um, and they quickly realized that his injuries were too great to be kept there and he was sent up to Rochester General Hospital. So all this is going on why I'm just a little one at my grandmother's house. <sighs> Sorry. Some days are harder to talk about this than others. And I think with the memorial being yesterday, I am just like, uh, am I all broken out? Because <clears throat> I feel like I got hives. Um, My mother comes home. This is all retrospective speaking because as a child, I don't really remember any of this. My mother finally comes home on uh, September 11th, two days later. And my uncle in the book recites about how my mother comes home. And um, she tells us that our father is deceased. I don't remember it at all. You know, as a child, I don't think you really get it. But I do remember seeing my mother being very upset and being at my grandmother's house. <coughs> um, we stayed at my grandparents' house for three weeks. Uh, my father's funeral was on the 15th. And I don't know if, I don't know if ha how many of you have had the opportunity to read the book, but there is several photos uh, of my dad's procession. I got, I got some more right, right now, so thank, thank you very much, baby. <laughs> Here's an extra clean. Thank you, honey. I'm going to need that. No mm -hmm. problem. Um, so I personally don't remember my mother saying this um, to us girls, but I can tell you in three weeks when we went home, um, I very quickly realized that my dad was not going to be there. Um, upstairs across from our room was a desk where my father used to hang his shirt. And, but it would be gone most of the time by the time I got up for school, but it was there at like nighttime, you know, and my mother would wash her shirt, put it out for my father, and I realized that the blue shirt stayed on the chair day after day after day. That's when I, as a kid, figured out that my dad was not coming back. So, growing up, there were a lot of questions um, surrounding my dad. And 
I didn't get a lot of answers from my mom, and mainly because it was just too difficult for her to talk about. And although I didn't understand at the time, I just didn't understand that why we couldn't talk about it. Um, I will tell you that my dad's parents um, literally stopped discussing my father. It was like when he died, they packed up all of his stuff, his fishing gear, his Boy Scout stuff, everything. And they never spoke about him again. And we knew it was pretty much an unwritten rule to ask my grandmother or grandfather Quinn any questions about my dad. There were a few people in the family that would talk to us about our dad. And I think it wasn't an intention to like not give us information. I think it was, they almost thought it was like a protective thing. Um, but, and, and I could appreciate that as a mom now that you only wanted to tell children so much information at a particular age. But even as I got older, um, it was something that really was not discussed in our house. So, and I knew when, when I asked my mom questions, when I got a little older, um, that I, I felt so bad about it because my mother would just tear up. And so I equated with that, you know, you don't want to upset your mom, but you're dying to know something about your dad. My dad's sister, Aunt Fran, um, would tell us things about her brother, um, my dad, uh, on occasions, a few tidbits, you know, you would pick up uh, through life. And my Uncle Bob, um, which is my Aunt Fran's husband who also worked at the prison, um, would, would give us information every once in a while. He was my dad's best friend. And um, uh, as painful as it was to talk to us about dad, I think oftentimes it made him happy. And before he passed away, I was able to talk to my Uncle Bob <clears throat> in greater detail, um, especially at the end because he had dementia. And so he could talk almost without having any feeling connected to it. So I, I was able to get a lot of information about my dad just prior to his death. So um, I'll go back to our, the childhood real quick. So we're living um, in Attica, and I start getting sick. I can't go back to school. You know, I go back to school and I get sick and I get home, sent home. Everybody's kind of getting sick. My mother is sick. And we go to the doctor. The doctor tells my mother, you know, that, you know, Dee's probably got a stomach problem. You know, it's probably related to anxiety. Um, the best that you can do is, you know, kind of make things as normal as possible. And nor things were really not normal at our house. I mean, my dad used to put us to bed. And now <coughs> I have grandfathers on a rotating schedule with uncles that are coming over and neighbors. Um, to help with Christmas toys together, to help put us to bed at night, you know, to help with homework or, you know, carpooling or whatever it was. It just was not, you know, an, an, my mother did the best that she could. Um, so we go to the doctor, um, who was Doc Bissell at that time. And we lives in Attica, that's your doctor. Um, and we found out, you know, that I have the stomach issue and, it, and it's anxiety and my mother is pregnant. So six weeks after burying my dad, we find out that she is pregnant. Um, and my sister Amy was born in May of 1972 after my father passed. That's a rough one. They ended up having a shower um, for my mom. All of the corrections officers, um, all the all the women that were married to corrections officers that were close to our family. My mother didn't want a shower for Amy until after she was born. And we have pictures of Amy in a little seat in the middle of a table with, you know, gifts and things like that. Um, but that was a really tough time and I, I can talk to my mom about that. And, you know, I said, Mom, that must have been really hard. And she said it was and there were people who were very opinionated who thought that maybe I shouldn't continue with the pregnancy. But she said, honestly, it was all I had left of him. <coughs> and as you can see, if anybody knows by the pictures of my dad inside my book, how much my sister looks like my dad. So I do think it was a blessing. And her son looks so much like my father, it's just scary. Um, <laughs> Liam, his name is named after my father. So um, we're living now in Attica. My mother tries to make things normal. After my sister is born, she starts dating a man, Wayne Newton. And uh, marries Wayne Newton in 1973. So two years later, I have a stepfather, which was a little bit hard to adjust to, because he was so very different than my dad, and I could just feel it in my bones. Um, 
1973, they were remarried. Um, or my mother was remarried. And we decided to leave Attica. I think my parents, I think my mom and my stepfather thought it would be good for us kids to get out of Attica, leave those memories behind, <coughs> start anew. So in 1974, 75, I'm not sure when the house was finished, we moved to Dereham. And within no time at all, um, we left our little town of Attica, which was kind of our safety net. Um, I had a stepfather. I had a new baby sister. I had a new house. I had a new school. And I had a new religion. Yeah, way too much for a kid. Just way too much. So my anxiety that I had when I was living in my little safe spot just grew. I mean, I just had a terrible, terrible, terrible time at school was just not good, and of course, you know, you're coming into school and everybody knows who you are. And the story that Amy always tells is that, you know, Amy kind of knows who she is, but she doesn't really know who she is, but all the teachers are there and she's starting kindergarten. And my mother like gets her ready and we have to get on the bus, and as we get on the bus really quick, she hands her a lunch and says, oh, by the way, your dad's William Quinn and he was killed in the riot, so if any of the teachers ask you, if you're the Quinn girl, yes, you are. I mean, that's like, that's it, and then we go down. We go down the driveway and get on the bus. I mean, it's just kind of crazy. That's how our mother gave us information. It was in like spits and spatters and kind of at the exact time when she thought you should know it, not a minute before. Um, so it was a lot. And uh, But the thing that you should know that I, I think is interesting too is that um, the people, the corrections officers and the civilian employees who worked at the prison right after the riot, um, you know, why we went home and tried to make the best out of life, they encouraged um, all, all the family members that were involved, um, held hostage, that were injured and released, to go home and take six months um, worth of time off. You know, spend it with your family, get counseling if you so determine, um, but be a good soldier and don't talk to anybody. Let's just keep this to ourselves, um, and we're gonna pay you just like your regular paycheck. Um, so that you can kind of stay home and get better, and then we're going to see you back at work in six months. So um, there was a meeting in the church at St. Vincent's, and um, the commissioner came in, said, don't worry about it, we're going to take care of you. We're going to be sending you um, checks that you can cash, uh, take care of your families. And in those checks that we received that looked just like my father's regular check with the same amount of money in it, um, a portion of that check was pulled out of workman's compensation. And for anybody who knows anything about law, um, if you cash a check with workman's compensation in it, knowingly or unknowingly, it's called an election of remedy. It still stands today. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. It's called a, I an election it's... of remedy. Okay, are you going to define that? Mm -hmm. Election of remedy is when you when you knowingly or unknowingly cash a check that contains workman's compensation in it. So essentially you have, you have accepted workman's compensation without necessarily knowing it. It's a tricky dick kind of thing, and the state of New York does it very well. Um, I actually went down to Long Island to meet with uh, a higher up by the name of Morris Jacobs, he's in the book, um, to meet with this, because it's almost unfathomable. Why would they you know, do this? But they did it. Purposefully. Well, I think that they knew that this kind of tragedy in New York State was historical. And if the family sued for tort, which is injury from your employer, maybe the state would bankrupt. I have no idea. But they even broke their own policy. And one of their policies were that they were not to ever um, approach a widow until they had appropriate legal representation. So no checks were ever sent in the history of the state fund insurance company. So they send us checks and we cash them and they don't tell us and that was the trick. And we lost. We were unable to sue. Now this was all of our families, 51 families. Um, there was one woman um, who actually got this really weird check um, and it was for $26. And my Uncle Dean got a weird check too, it was for $24. And I think I have a copy of it in the book. And they sent it to um, us because it was for their food money while they were being held hostage, um, or a strange check that had overtime in it because while they were being held hostage, the state of New York paid them straight time for the first eight hours, double time for the second eight hours, 
and then no money for the third eight hours because they were sleeping, being held hostage. Oh, that's, that's always good. Mm -hmm. So there was one woman who actually um, did not cash her check. She got herself an attorney. Edward Cunningham was the attorney. And um, she actually did sue. It took her from 1971 to 1984, I believe. And she settled at $550,000, but with interest, she ended up with a million dollars. So, um, in the meantime, um, I'm gonna jump forward a little bit. How am I doing that time? Oh my God, 20 minutes, I gotta get through a lot. Um, okay, I'm fine, right. okay. So, um, No, um, you're fine, Okay, so, um, growing up, um, when I got older, I, I started hearing these two names that were always surrounded by my dad's, and one was, uh, it's a rather long name, his name is John um, Hill um, Boncor Decajulia. Um, and he was convicted of the murder of my father. Um, he was the, and then there was another person, Charles Pernasleys who was charged with assault first. These were the only two people that were ever charged in the connection of my father's death because there were witnesses that saw them beat my dad. Were there others that beat my dad? Probably, but these two were witnesses. So after the trials, um, they went into trial uh, April of 1974, I think it was. Um, there were trials, and I remember like at that point, there was no TV in our house, no TV, just in case it came over the news or whatever it was. Um, but I remember um, my grandmother, Quinn, who was a writer for the Buffalo newspaper, was so distraught that um, these two had been through trial, and I'm going to tell you what happened. John Boncor, Parnassalus Decajuia, was convicted of murder, and then his sentence was computed, commuted in 1976. Governor Hugh Carey commuted his sentence, which means that um, his sentence stays as a murderer but he's commuted, he doesn't have to serve any time for it. And the only time that he ever did serve after the Attica riot was time that he owed on his previous charge. Um, Charles Pernashley, is his, he was actually pardoned, um, so he served no time for injuring my father. Um, and so on December 31st, 1976, um, it was Governor um, Carey at that time, closed the book on Attica, and um, any corrections officers or any inmates that had um, been through the court systems um, were either commuted or pardoned, nine of them. Were the two men that witnessed the saw beat your father, mm -hmm. were they still at Attica or was there a huge transfer process going on? So the prisons, the riot was in 1971. By 1974, many of those who witnessed, the two men who had witnessed them, one had stayed at Attica, one had transferred back to Auburn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Many of them, when they came back, in that six month time period when they came back, um, almost everybody got better bids. So you were maybe up on the tower, or if you originally came from Auburn, like one of the um, corrections officers that witnessed the beating of my father actually went back to Auburn. They could pretty much have whatever they wanted, you know, whatever bid that they wanted, whatever. Um, so, where was I? So, so I find out that this is, you know, these are these people's names, and um, and I will tell you that John Boncourt makes history for a lot of reasons. Deca Julia, um, never in uh, New York State judicial history is someone sentenced commuted for the death of a of a peace officer, and that's where our corrections officers are. So that made history. So moving forward, um, I'm part of the Forgotten Vixens of Attica. Um, I joined this group in, in January of 2000. In 2000, the inmates um, had a lawsuit that was over two decades old that was just floating in the courts. Nobody wanted to touch it. So we did touch it at one point up in Buffalo, um, Judge Curtin. And uh, there was a rather large award, um, Big Black, I don't know if any, so Big Black was in the riot and, and he, people thought that he was like a leader as well. He ended up a judgment, getting a judgment for his injuries of $4 million. And then David Brossig, who was another um, inmate, ended up getting $750,000. Um, those were held up on appeal, but the state quickly figured out that if these inmates, over 1,260 of them, go to court, they're gonna also bankrupt the state of New York. So um, in 2000, Judge Teleska was tapped 
um, who is a federal court judge out of Rochester um, by Governor Pataki to end this two decades for. Um, Pataki gave him $12 million and said, do with it what you will. So um, in August of 2000, the inmates started having testimony up in Rochester. I'm not sure if any of you guys saw it. I never went. Um, but that's why we essentially formed. Um, I got a call from a correction officer who said, you know, we're really bad out of shape about the fact that inmates are getting money. We don't believe that they should get money. Um, and we're just going to meet. So we kind of met and we started meeting originally at um, in Attica, the American Legion. And then after the American Legion, um, it was the QWL, which was a building right on the grounds of Attica. Um, and we met for, I don't know how many years, like years. Um, and we decided that we would try to do the best that we could with the inmate lawsuit by writing letters and so on. And it was in that time that I found out that the two men who were commuted and pardoned were in the yard um, during the retaking and could be legally part of this settlement. So when I found out that they actually might get paid, I, you know, just like lost it. And I wrote a letter, we did as a family, wrote a letter to Judge Tulaska and um, told them how disappointing, you know, the judicial system in New York State was that these men had already caught their break by be having their sentence commuted and pardoned. And now, because they were um, part of the lawsuit, and the lawsuit, the lawsuit specifically said if you were an inmate um, who was injured and or hurt or even in the yard um, during the retaking slash rehousing, you would be available to come and testify and you would get a monetary reparations. Um, so when I found out that both of those men were now potentially going to get paid, like I said, we wrote a letter. Um, I got a call from Judge Teleska. He agreed that it wasn't a good thing. And I basically just said that if this goes forward and it goes public, that I would turn his courtroom into a circus. That's what I said. Um, he didn't take kindly to that. We met in person, and we decided that the best thing that we could do for everybody was to make sure that both of those people got paid, judge was going to uh, give them the minimum amount of $6,500, and that they would not be paid directly and not on the books, which means in the decision of El Jundi, if anybody ever looks, and it's like, I don't know, 2,000 pages long, you will not find either one of their names in there because the judge take it out. They were paid through their attorneys, however. And actually, one of them didn't get paid on time, and Charles Pernasley actually wrote a letter to me <laughs> asking if I could expedite his money to him. Oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I had several attempts from John Hill for him to contact me. And I'll just tell this little funny thing. It's not very funny at all. I was talking about Attica at UB um, at the 40th anniversary. It's called UB40. And uh, my girlfriend um, was sitting up in the audience who was an attorney. And she's texting me, and I'm down on the panel. And she says to me, John Hill is here. John Hill. Like, he's been my boogeyman my entire life, right? This man who killed my father. John Hill's here. And I am dying. Oh, you know, I just, and I, it, I had already talked, so I was done, you know, talking so I could kind of answer my phone. And she said, look to the left of me. Of course, I mean, I don't know what this guy looks like. All I know is he's of Puerto Rican Indian descent. I have no idea. And uh, apparently he was there. And at, at the end of this thing, um, the man that was sitting next to him from that area up there, I could see him coming down. And uh, he comes to the microphone and he says, um, I have a question for D. Quinn Miller. And I said, okay. I'm thinking, oh my God, what am I gonna say? What am I gonna do? What's this gonna look like? This is not gonna be good. So I had brought with me that day a friend of mine that was a correction officer at Attica, his name is Rick Harcro. The man is so big, he blocks out the sun, right? Six foot three, but a teddy bear. So I bring him with me to kind of like help me out. And I'm looking at Ricky to like go, hey, this guy's coming down. I want to take care of him. He's asleep. Oh, he's asleep. So I'm on my own. So this guy comes down in the microphone and he says, um, D, if John Boncourt was John Boncourt Hill, Decca Julia, if he was here today, and wanted to talk to you and offer an apology, what would you say? And I thought, well, if he wants to offer an apology, that must mean he's guilty, because why else would you apologize? And two, no, I never want to talk to you, ever. So um, I just sat there for a minute, because I was completely in a daze, and I said, 
um, I, I never intend to speak to John Hill or Charles Panastles. Um, they mean absolutely nothing to me, and they have to live with the consequences, you know, until God gets a hold of them. And uh, the rest of it is, is on him. I don't want anything to do with him. So once UB figured out what was going on, I had security, they walked out, and John apparently was there. I apparently was only about eight feet away from him in the hallway, but I couldn't even recognize him. I didn't know who he was. So I've had two brushes with the men who killed my father. Um, interestingly enough, John Von Corhill Decajuia uh, died a couple years ago. I got a call from the state police that said um, he died while going to the store and getting beer. And he was very drunk and he slipped on some shell rock going up his front steps and his head um, and had a head injury so severe he died. So that was kind of interesting. So, so the Forgotten Victims of Attica, you guys, I, I'm sure you guys have seen, you know, that and the whole thing. And we lobbied and, you know, we were like trying to figure out what the state of New York could do for us because here we are as the families. And I will tell you, with those paychecks that were coming in that were supposed to take care of these people, like the Cunningham family, I don't know if anybody knows the Cunninghams, they had eight children and they lived under the line of poverty. Almost every family that their father was killed in the riot were left to live under the line of poverty, literally. Um, and the only reason that our family didn't is because my father um, had a life insurance policy that had a double indemnity rider on it. So, you know, we did okay. But those women were the women that had to go to the bank to beg the bank for a loan from this fund so they could put a furnace in their house or put a new roof on their house or whatever it was. It was really terrible. Um, so anyhow, um, we did, as the Forgotten Victims of Attica, we did lobbying. Um, we asked for a task force to be um, put together, which was, um, and that was in, around 2002. In 2002, all the members of the Forgotten Victims of Attica that wanted to could um, give oral testimony, which the state of New York was completely against, because God forbid we actually be able to give testimony and tell our side of the story and have it in print and have media come and tell our story, because stories like this have power, and people pick up on that, and people in the legislature pick up on that. Um, and we were lobbying the legislature to do something. I can't tell you the number of trips I took back and forth to Albany. I mean, ungodly times, and my sisters were great because they babysit my kids because they were little at that time. Um, and we knew that we could not sue them, so we had to shame them. And it was shame on them for paying inmates $8 million and their attorneys $4 million for a total of $12 million, shame on them, while they left the families of their very own employees, you know, I mean, families fell apart. There were suicides in, in, our, in the Forgotten Victims of Attica's families. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there was mental illness. Nobody got counseling. Um, people, you know, there was, you know, teen pregnancies. There was all sorts of things going on within our families. And we were literally just struggling, you know, to get by day by day. And so we would walk and lobby them and just shame them. So um, at one point, sorry, mm -hmm. what kind of benefits did you get? Health care insurance? Did mm -hmm. you get? Yeah, you, we did. You Any did. of the surviving children, we, we ended up getting the state's uh, health insurance. So mm -hmm. as soon as you turned 18, it was gone? Caught off. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. I actually ended up having to buy my own policy when I started college, my own health care policy. Kind of crazy. Um, anyhow, so um, where was I? I do this a lot. Um, we negotiate with the state, and at one point, the tacky finally comes back and he says, Fine, I've had enough of all of you. Um, here's what I'm going to do I'm going to put some money together, and I'm going to ask Judge Teleska to disperse it. And we agreed that would be fine. And so we originally came in with um, $50 million because there were 50 families. Um, and, and the million dollars was based on the woman who, remember, her name was Mrs. Jones. Mrs. Jones, who hadn't cashed her check, but had sued, 550 plus interest was a million dollars in 1984. So we were asking for a million dollars a piece as well. And they were like, you know, that's not gonna happen, Dave. Well, it's a place to start, right? So we negotiate, we negotiate, and um, oh, we had meetings up in Albany, we had meetings with governor's council, we had meeting with the governor. 
Um, and I think that they felt like they wanted to do something, but they just didn't know what we kept saying. You know, we would, you know, the only thing, if you're not going to give us an apology, and let me just say that we asked, we had a five point plan for justice, right? We want an apology. And I still think that that's still important today. It's the one thing that I don't have. Um, we wanted counseling for those who um, needed it and or wanted it. And so the state came back after our reparations were made and said, just take your money that we give you and just go get counseling yourself. We're not going to pay for that. Um, reparations, obviously. An annual memorial service, this is probably funny too, because the background of this is that um, there is a huge monument um, on the very front. If you drive by Yak, you'll see a monument, which was paid for by corrections officers' personal money as well as townspeople's personal money. But unfortunately, they put it on state property. So every year, if you want to go up and you know, see that thing, well, first of all, you can't get on the on lawn because there's a guy on 14 post, you know, with a gun who's asking you why you're there, and that you can't get up around that monument at all. So we ended up having corrections law amended because they did not want us to have a service um, up there. They didn't want us to have a service anywhere. Um, so we we had amended law. The governor uh, amended corrections law, and we were allowed to have a memorial service um, on September 13th on the front lawn of the prison, which we just did yesterday because yesterday was the 51st anniversary. And then we also opened, we also asked for opening of the records, because remember in 1976, when Hugh Carey came in and he said, I'm closing the book on Attica, that meant all the records, anything you wanted to find was pretty much closed, and grand jury is still closed to this day. Um, so to get to the end, we are negotiating. Um, I, I have the telephone, I have the office in my, in my home and the telephone rings and I had just gotten just had a meeting with our attorneys which was Gary Horton who's a public defender here in Batavia um, Jonathan Gredes who's the head of NICE the New York State Defenders Association which is the agency that I work for now um, and Malcolm and Ross and they were like Dee, if they call you don't take just don't take anything I'm like okay like what do I take and they're like well let's just you know let's try to get to 12 because that's the that's the standard of the inmates they have to give us at least 12 I said okay so they called and I talked to Judge, or I talked to Governor's Council. He's a really nice guy. And he's like, look at Dave, we looked at things. You know, the only thing we can do is eight million. And after all, the inmates got eight million, so we're only gonna give your family eight million. And by the way, how much do your attorneys want out of that eight million? So wait a minute. The inmates got eight million dollars and they had four million dollars for their for their lawyers who had worked on the case for over twenty-five years. Why does our lawyers' fees have to come out of the eight million dollars? So we go back, we have a meeting, said so they offered eight million dollars, but they want to know how much our attorneys want. And of course, our one attorney is there, Gary's there, but Jonathan's not, he's on the phone, he says, tell him zero. We don't want any money. I can't tell you, they deserved every penny of whatever it was that they were gonna ask for. I mean, they literally could be millionaires right now and not have to work, but that's not what they did. Neither one accepted a penny. Um, so I called back, I said, nope, eight million is not gonna work, okay. So then we wait a little bit longer and they call back and I'm, I'm talking to our counsel and they said, you know, D, I, I think we're getting to 10, but you know, I think we're gonna get to 12. So I think it's really important we get to 12. So on December 19th, they call my house and they say, look at, um, we're at 10 million and that's, that's as good as it's gonna get. And you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, that's a no. And I like, hang up the phone. I was like, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that. And uh, I called the art attorney and I said, I just turned on it. $10 million. That was like the right thing to do, right? And they were both kind of like quiet. I was like, that was the right thing to do, right? I mean, you told me we're held up for $12 million. And he said, let me go back and talk with them. But they didn't call back. And then uh, my anxiety really kicked into high gear. And I was certain that I had ruined this for 50 families, that I had just turned down $10 million for 186 people. That's a substantial chunk of money for these families. And I ended up at the emergency room here um, on a psychiatric hold <laughs> um, because, as you can imagine, I went in there and I told them that I had just turned down $10 million from the state of New York and that I really wanted more money and that I represent this group of people and they were like, oh yeah, right, so here's a shot and you can go to sleep and when you wake up you can tell us what's really going on. <laughs> because, I mean, honestly, can you imagine somebody crazy coming in saying that? Um, so anyhow, I, 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 ended up, I don't even think I stayed there. I think I just came home with my husband. Um, but I was really, really a mess. And um, Jonathan and Gary and um, Malcolm called the governor and told him that I had been hospitalized due to this. And, you know, I do like George Pataki. Um, 
Pataki says, let's make it 12. So on December 23rd, 2004, Governor Pataki's council calls me and says, $12 million, take it or leave it. I said, take it. And we did. And we dispersed the money over, I don't know how many years it was, six years, four years, whatever it was. Um, and the money started at, we did it like um, a personal injury lawsuit where um, the person who, people who are injured um, are killed, are paid at the most, and then, you know, those that were not injured or maybe just there and had trauma um, got the least amount. So our mother was awarded the highest um, amount um, in New York State underneath the settlement, which was $550,000. Um, the other widows all received $500,000, and the only reason my father got more was because he lived for two days, which is pain and suffering. Um, and then it, it dropped another category to $186,000, and it dropped another category. So there were categories for people that the judge um, worked out through um, testimony. And I'd like to say that that's the end of the story, but it's not, because the one thing that I have not gotten from the state of New York is an apology. And an op-ed piece was just ran um, in the Times Union, as well as USA Today, yesterday, asking Governor Hochul for an apology. Last year, on the 50th anniversary, um, the Department of Corrections were, were prepared for her to come. Apparently, she was going to offer an apology. But her handlers, because she was new, right, she was just she was in the office only about three months, um, told her that they didn't think it was prudent of her because um, she hadn't in, she hadn't investigated it enough, and that it would be a slippery slope for her to apologize on behalf of people who came before her. So was this close to getting an apology? So she said that she would look into it and potentially talk with those who. Um, you know, have been through it. So I quickly wrote a letter to her, and I sent her my book, and I called a friend up there and made sure she got it, which she did. And um, I'm still waiting, but I haven't given up. Um, I'm just slowing down because I'm tired. And um, talking about this is really hard. Any question? Um, I think a few weeks ago I saw that New York State apologized for their part in the Tuskegee Airmen, everything that was done to them. Why would they apologize to the Tuskegee Airmen in Alabama and not to what happened to their own employees um, in their own retaking? That's a really good question. Yeah. Could you repeat what she said? I couldn't. So she was saying, how is it that um, other people, like the Tuscany Airmen, um, are apologized to? And I think gave them reparations, if I'm not mistaken, as well. Um, yet we can't even get it from the state of New York. Who was governor at the time? Mm -hmm. Mark Pella? And does it match Kathy Hochul's party? Um, I don't think so. Wasn't Rockefeller a Democrat? Right. Oh, he's a Republican. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So Rockefeller was an interesting guy because I don't think he gave two hoots about the working class. Uh, they had asked him to come to ATCA during the riot, in which he refused because he said, you know, I can't go there and negotiate with thieves and rapists, um, regardless if it was it meant that our men would live or not. Um, Rockefeller had high aspirations to run uh, for vice president and president, um, but I think Attica came to bite him in the butt later on because his political career pretty much stopped after that. His political career pretty much stopped after that. There were plenty of people who didn't agree with the way he hired, you know, the, he, the way that he um, took care of Attica. And in the book too, and I'm sure if anybody's seen the movies, um, our Governor Rockefeller was making phone calls to Nixon, and Nixon was taking the call. So Nixon knew what was going on, and he wanted to know if those blacks were part of this, mm -hmm. and we just can't have this kind of anarchy within our jails, and congratulated him for a job well done, and a good decision to not go to the prison when the inmates asked. Do you get the start of the riot you mentioned your father was at Times Square in, in that intersection there. Were there other COs that were with him at the time that were injured? At, at that exact time that your, your father passed, were other short right at that immediate time or your dad was the only one in there? My dad was the only one in Times Square at the time. 
he had locked those other ones into say in, into the other parts so there wasn't anybody else in there there were some inmates that were coming down from the administration building that the inmates also got to and they beat them stripped them um, some of them were taken out to the yard some of them they just took their um, prison off you know um, uniforms and went out to the yard and one other thing was there any research to determine if the inmates had sort of pre-planned the riot for that morning or was it just sort of a spontaneous thing they just saw an opportunity to start it or was there any history on that at all or there are so many theories on whether Attica just blew up or it was planned I mean there was things that were going on like this incident the night before right where out there was some horseplay out in one of the yards and back then uh, an inmate never touched uh, an officer and there was some horseplay out in the yard. They told them to stop it, and they don't. They don't even know to this day whether that was supposed to be the start of the riot. So the horseplay ended up where the guard on the tower stayed, but he sent the other ones down to break it up. And one of the inmates that got broke that they were breaking up actually shoved um, uh, a, a sergeant, I believe it was, in the chest, which never, never, never happens. You just at that time it just didn't happen and they thought at that time that was the time that the riot would go off that, because there was a, a pretty good sized fight in the yard and then that guy got locked down that night a can of tuna got thrown at the head of a uh, corrections officer who's just coming through there was a lot of just stuff going on i, I don't really know I, I don't know i'm not sure and you know george jackson was killed in california you know with the gun in the afro he gets killed um there was a lot of stuff and just the racial you know tension and tones of that time I don't know. I tend to think that it was spontaneous. Mm -hmm. I think the when that door was closed, but, uh, the tension were building days in advance, and then it just erupted. Absolutely, it was a powder keg. Just yes, I think so too. Mm -hmm. And I think it could not have been the cow. That's like people say. You know, do you think that it? I, I don't know if it ever could have been stopped, but um, I think that those concerns were addressed, but they were not addressed appropriately. The inmates' concerns. Um, and I think, you know, with the incidents that happened the night before, I don't know, I think maybe there, it could have been handled a different way. But I, I do think it was spontaneous. I do. Any other questions? Yeah, when I spoke to you about Johnny Motley, you were know, mm -hmm. gonna say something about him, or, or just to me? Well. That's all right, you can talk to me after. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, you know, normally I, I give, you know, a much longer talk, and I talk about the ballistics, and. Um, the state police going in and the number of people who are killed. So, um, you know, the ballistics report tell us that um, of the 10 that were killed that are state employees and our fathers, nine of them were killed by New York State gunfire, state police gunfire, corrections gunfire. But there was also John Montleon, who when they took him in for his autopsy, pulled out a Ruger bullet, Ruger. It, so it's a, a gun, so we know that there were people in there with personal sidearms, with personal guns that went in. And John Montleone was shot through the back of the neck that spliced his aorta and killed him. But it was not by a state trooper or a 270 shooter or, or a corrections it officer. Inmate. It was not an inmate. It was a correction officer who brought in his own gun. Correction officer? Inmates didn't have guns. <laughs> I know, but I, they sometimes anything could get in the prison, mm -hmm. you know. So it was a, um, an officer that yep. shot Johnny, mm -hmm. not on purpose. But okay. when this gas was dropped and the yard was retaken, you couldn't see anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. I know. Okay, so let's go to the story I heard from their family. Mm -hmm. That okay. is the story. I've seen the autopsy report. I've investigated it. Um, I've talked talk with Dr. Baden, who was the second to um, do the autopsies. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought I read that the daughter of the coroner mm -hmm. did an intensive investigation. Mm -hmm. Did she also write a book? No, she hasn't written a book. She has not written mm -hmm. a book. No. But she did an intensive investigation. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, she's a wonderful person. They live in Louisiana. She was up last year for the anniversary, for the 50th anniversary. Okay. Uh -huh. What is her name? Her name is, hold on. I can, I'll find it. I'm sure it's in my notes. Where's the sister got your tongue? It's on the tip of your tongue. Look at it. Sorry. Try anything. 
because it's a married name. Um, I can't remember right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Steve, I guess one other thing. So your father was the only one killed at the hands of the inmates. All the other COs were killed during the retaking of the prison, correct? You got it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Any Did other questions or comments? Were the hostages up until you're acquiring 12 minutes, were the hostages treated different than the rest of them? When they went back to work, you mean? Or? No, monetarily. Um, no. Yeah. They, no. They were, um, the way that the dispersion for reparations was done was done like a personal injury. So if they were injured egregiously, then they got X amount of money. But if they were not injured egregiously, then they got less money. And those that were injured and released, I think, um, those, I think, got like hundred and some thousand dollars. So they weren't treated differently, but they were broken up into different categories for reimbursement in 2008. Did you know Charlie the quarter? Yes. Mm -hmm. He made this belt buckle. Oh, did he? Yeah. That's nice. Yes, I know. I went to school with uh, the son of the quarter. Kevin or? I think it was Kevin. I don't really remember. Did you ever meet Elmer or Elmer? Elmer Hewen? I love Elmer Hewen. You know his story? Pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Mrs. Hewen worked for me for at the time of the uprising. Yeah, Elmer Hewen. Elmer Hewen was a wonderful man. I had the um, honor of meeting and knowing him and hearing, because you know he's got this scar that goes like that. It's like, had to be from Africa, right? Who are you talking about? Who are you talking about? Elmer Hewen, who was a who was a correction officer who was held hostage for five what days. What's the last name? Hewen. Hewen. Okay. Mm -hmm. H U E M. Yeah. I think. yeah, Wyoming County, right? Warsaw. Warsaw. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. What about the legacy with, with your kids, Chris's kids, Amy's kids, mm -hmm. Rose's kids? I mean, how do they how do they deal with this? I don't really know. Is Amy still here? She doesn't leave. Okay. I don't know. Um, but do your children talk to you about it? Oh yeah, absolutely. My kids are a walking encyclopedia on Attica. And we always kid like if I was ever speaking and went down, like either one of my daughters could like just kick me aside and continue with my talk. Um, they know it so well. I don't really know because and there's a lot of things in our family. So my sister, um, my next younger sister Christine, she married a Schrader. And I don't know how many people know the Schraders in Batavia, but Mick Schrader is a retired state trooper who was involved in the retaking. Okay. So um, it's, a, it's like not Thanksgiving talk and it's not Christmas talk and um, I know the boys, my two nephews, their children have read my book. Um, and they're free to, I mean, the book was just for them to let them know who their grandfather was, what type of person he was, you know, that he was a humanitarian, that he, you know, believed um, in, in a want and a need to help people. And I mean, some of the things that are in my book is there's a, there's a man who flies up on his own dime and he's an inmate. And he goes to testify in the inmate settlement, and he he's he wasn't even in DR during the time, so he has no opportunity to be reimbursed or get money. But he came there specifically to tell them about my dad, specifically to say how much my father watched over him because he was a smaller stature man, he was only five foot two, and he was always being picked on. And my father used to lock him in early to make sure that he was safe. He would also check up to see how you doing in school. Do you need anything? So he flew up all by himself just to talk about how Bill Quinn helped him do his time better mm -hmm. and that he was so sad to learn that my father had died. But those are like some of the amazing little gifts that you get um, as you're like finding these things out because a lot of stuff I find out is not so great. Um, but some of those things are just amazing. And I was gonna go to court that day and I didn't end up going to court that day. I do have his testimony and I did end up speaking to him. Um, and he's, you know, a good man who um, is doing good things in Broward County, Florida. But he flew up. Any other questions? Yeah, I just have a statement. 
a friend of mine um, that was in prison, he was in the yard, but he was way in the back. It's a big black man, and he just got down and covered up himself, trying to be the smallest thing in the yard. But when the action lawsuit came, the state told him, if you sign on to that, you're never going to see the light of day. If you sign on to? If you sign on that action suit, you'll never see the light of day. That's unfortunate. Okay. Yeah. And the state was keeping the guys from testifying. But he said to heck with I'm already here. Mm -hmm. and Did he, he testify? Uh, he, he did whatever he needed to do. Mm -hmm. And he got, he got hit again. And they said, because he was like in his 50s, now 60s. And he had put in it in the middle of the 60s during black riots. Mm -hmm. They hit him for something he did when he was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. That's what they pulled him for the last hit. But he was finally released. He was out for like three months and then he died. Mm -hmm. But that's what they told the inmates. If you sign up, you'll never see the last day. So the state was after, but pushing on them too to keep quiet. That's interesting because in the lawsuit, Al Jundi, uh, it's about 2,000 pages. And there is testimony from, um, I can't tell you how many inmates who were still doing time and or were lifers at the time, that um, their families were able to collect a portion of the money if they were in DR during the retake. Really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just told him, if you, want, if you do that, you don't see the light of day. Then he got hit again. Anything else? Have you seen the film called Attica? Yeah, I was in it. You were in the film? Mm -hmm. Okay, because it was recently played at Dryden Theater. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you were interviewed? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, I was interviewed. Okay. Mm -hmm. What year was that film? I didn't catch that. So the Attica anymore. film that was just recently done? Pardon? The Attica film that was just recently done? I don't know what year it was. I just It was just it. done last year. Okay. That one. That, that, that's a Stanley Nelson. Pardon? Um, that's a Stanley Nelson movie. Oh, I see. The director, you're the director is called Stanley Nelson. Yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep. I'm from Warsaw. Mm -hmm. I was in gym class outside. You could just hear constantly the sirens going off and all the sheriff's cars leaving Warsaw. Mm -hmm. Never forget that. It's funny because when I talk about Attica, or somebody approaches me, it's like, I remember where I was that day. Don't oh, yeah. you? Yeah. I had this one woman said, <clears throat> she was on Route 98 at the four lanes there, and she said, I thought I was in huge trouble. Like, I, she said, I was speeding. Um, and she pulled over, and she said, probably 20 cop cars blew by her. She said, they had to be going 98 miles an hour. But everybody seems to like remember where they were. I'm a, I'm a Lancer there, uh -huh. and I survey a lot of Windsor Street this year. I know it's sold. Yeah. I know. Yeah. yeah, my cousin Ann sold the house, and she said, do you guys want to go in it and look at it? And it, when it was sold before, we actually went to the house and got to walk through it. But it was so different. You know, they had changed the kitchen and everything. I, I just, like, remember where the telephone used to be on the wall. We had a yellow telephone. And, uh, you know, like... All the, all the stuff that you just remember when you were kids, they had changed the stairs and made them wider because we had like these really creaky stairs that went up. But yeah, I finally got to go back there. It was, it was sad because the, uh, the abstract of title had your dance, that's what it was. See, these tiny bits of information that, you know, you're just not. You come and do a book talk, and I find something like that. And it's just amazing. You mentioned uh, this. Yeah. You went down Prospect. Mm hmm. Right across from school. He had a cop. Yes, he did. A bull. Yeah. With horns on it. <laughs> and we were all told not to go near it. And we actually did not. I mean, we, we, yeah, were, we, we, we walked home. Yeah. No, we walked on the other side of the street until we got past her. But there was a crossing guard where you had to cross, and it was almost in front of Doc Bissell's thing. But he did have a bull in his backyard. I, I, I was the lady sense. that lived up the street a couple houses. It had like 27 cats in their house. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I can remember going to the doctor's office, a big grandfather clock, and the smell of his office. Mm -hmm. I could smell that. Um, my memory of it is like, I graduated 68 from America. Mm -hmm. I was working, and I heard mm -hmm. that over the news. 
and I had four family members in that high school. All the way, you know, some of the junior, uh, the, the small kids, but the other ones, and all I was so scared because if they got out, go across that creek and they got our kids. Mm -hmm. But I was, I still remember that. I just was screaming. Mm -hmm. And then when somebody stopped to a little giant kid, it was like, no. Oh. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Any other questions? I just have a statement to make. Mm -hmm. uh, I have friends in Rochester because I worked there for years. They don't know anything about it. They never heard about this riot in Attica. They mm -hmm. couldn't believe this happened. Mm -hmm. And people in the state never knew about it. I know. No. That's funny. Well, it's, it's so sad. And I'm telling my hat, oh no, they, I guess it did. They I don't was, know. I was working outside Bennington when this all happened. And I, I remember, you know, of course, I knew where Attica was because we grew up in Elba. And I was like, oh, no, no, this is on TV. And they're like, oh, is that New York State? I mean, like, people right. really, I, yeah. you get outside this area, and people really didn't know anything about it. Right. Say it. right. I think the only time that Attica got any kind of acknowledgement is when those movies started way back yeah. then, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and then Attica got a name. And there was a TV, made for TV movie quite a long time Against ago. the Wall, I think it was called. Yeah. What was it called? Against the Wall? Maybe. I, yeah. guess, I don't know. That was way, way, way back when. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so do you, you were five when, the, when your father passed? Right. So do you have many memories of him? Or you, you were just too young to really recall a lot of him? I have some memories of him. Um, not a lot. It's hard most of them first year to think back exactly. to your parents, right? I mean, most of them, I think, come from, I mean, I have my own memories of things, and whether they're accurate or not, I don't really know. Mm -hmm. But um, sometimes I you know, have to look at pictures you know, and be like, oh yeah, you know, I remember that, or I remember that birthday cake, or I love that sweater I had, you know, like whatever it was, but a lot of times, you know, and as I get older, of course, they just, they fade. Yeah. You know, that's it's scary. Really yeah. Time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my husband grew up across the street, mm -hmm. and um, he was in kindergarten when he went first grade, mm -hmm. and he remembers that there was a state trooper command post in their house. Mm -hmm. Oh. around the phone in their, in their front hall, and I just wonder what kind of conversations were going on. Mm -hmm. We had, um, when we went to my grandmother's house, in my book, I, there's so many pieces that I didn't tell you because the book is like, you know, really long, but um, when we got to my grandmother's house, there were already state troopers there, black and whites, like in my grandfather's driveway, and we got taken in the front door, and um, during the time that we stayed there, um, they had a man on a pole with a utility truck underneath them, and he was really not a utility man, he was really a state trooper. Um, and then my grandfather would be in the basement almost all day, and cars would come and go. I remember like opening up the basement, and my grandmother reached ahead of me, and she said, that's not for ladies. And But I remember seeing gray uh, clothed men that were in uniforms, and you could hear them talking, mm -hmm. um, and coming in and out of the driveway. Yeah, my husband says, even at five, he remembers they were talk, talking about the Black Panthers yes. coming, could, yes. from 98, coming across the field right behind our house, the possibility. Yeah. That's exactly why they were at our house. They thought that this was the Black Panther movement and potentially it may tie to target um, our family. Mm -hmm. yeah. We had state troopers outside of our house for on and off for probably a year after my father passed. Um, at the end of a street, at the beginning of the street, at a police officer just parked out front. We had, um, we had to take our phone. I can't tell you how long we lived in that house with the phone hanging down. Mm -hmm. um, and then at night my mother would put it back on and then my grandmother would ring twice and then she would pick it up, mm -hmm. call her back. That's how we knew how to communicate because it was just reporters. I had a grandfather quit on the front porch and I had a grandfather Willard on the back porch because the newspaper reporters were so obnoxious that they would try to come around to the back of the house, the back porch of the house, and um, you know, just try to knock on a window or look in a look in a door or whatever it was. And but you told your mom to try to keep your life normal. Try to keep your life normal. Yeah. That was the philosophy back then, right? Like just try to get everything back to normal for yeah. your kids, because that is good. All the things I have how yeah. can you get back? Well, first of all, how can you get back to normal when there is no normal? Exactly. But I think back then there just wasn't that kind of, you know, acknowledgement. Kids will just bounce back, yeah. you know, kind of a thing. Yeah. So, 
Anything else? Nice job, Dean. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.